my name is Rebecca Ramsey, and my Twitter handle is rramseymaps, and I can be found on GitHub at rcramsey. This digital mapping project explores the current state of historically redlined neighborhoods through the lens of continued denial of equitable access to home ownership and its related benefits, all of which is related to the persistence of racist loan practices. There's a lot of ground to cover, and I won't be able to detail it all. However, the presentation itself is linked in the Slack channel, and this recording will be made available on NASA's YouTube channel in a couple of weeks, for you to revisit in depth, and the presentation itself, and all the links and references are found in the comments section of the PowerPoint. This project was completed as a culmination of my master's thesis at University of Kentucky in the digital mapping New Maps Plus program. I was inspired to dig into this topic after sitting in on an environmental justice and systemic racism series that was hosted by the EPA during 2021. In a brief overview, we will cover what the redlining Hulk program was, how I developed an interactive web map, a couple demonstrations of redlining's fingerprint today within Lexington, Kentucky, a place I've called home for eight years, and the environment of persistent racial loan practices. For those of you not familiar, during the 1930s Great Depression, unemployment was common in the U.S., and many homeowners were on the verge of foreclosure. So Congress passed legislation to create the Homeowners Loan Corporation. I refer to it as Hulk. Hulk was responsible for determining if a homeowner qualified for assistance to help refinance and prevent foreclosure of their home. Hulk began in 1933 and granted loans for only three years, ending in 1936. In an effort to turn around quick decisions and help families as soon as possible, maps were created by local city appraisers or familiar entities with the city, such as real estate agents, outlining their city's neighborhoods by hazard rating. On the right-hand side of the screen is the Hulk map for Lexington, Kentucky. On the left is the breakdown of these hazard ratings and demographics from the 1940s for Lexington. These ratings were intended to indicate to a lending institution the perceived hazard of foreclosure risk of granting a loan to a homeowner based on its neighborhood. The neighborhoods deemed most hazardous were indicated on maps with the color red, hence redlining. Descriptions were typically included in the determination of a neighborhood's loan risk, unfortunately. Due to inherent racist practices of the times, race was included in these descriptions as a factor. Such language as infiltration by an undesirable or low-grade population would accompany racist references to populations who were not white within neighborhoods. Assistance afforded to the white populations from 1933 to 1936 with this program was not granted equally among all races because of the inherent racist descriptions the program was based on. I wanted to create a map that could communicate to the public the relationships between denial of equitable access to home ownership from racist loan practices, that is, redlining, and the related benefits that were denied by denying home ownership assistance. Benefits to home ownership include equity building as a form of savings, hedging against inflation, and prevention of increase in monthly rent payments, write-offs on taxes, and in theory, long-term appreciation if no massive recession occurs during the sale. 2020's Wainer and Zabel did conclude the timing of the purchase and sale of the home matters with regards to the wealth benefits, but through time, it has been a general claim that home ownership provides one of the few ways a low-income household could accumulate wealth. To communicate potential relationships of denied home ownership access and the related benefits, I needed to compare data from two different sources. I landed on a wireframe that would demo two side-by-side -side maps or stacked maps depending on the device. And one map would host the original Hulk map data of Lexington, Kentucky, which came from the Mapping Inequality Collaborative Project and can be seen on the bottom left of the screen. The second map would host the most recent Census Bureau tracked data with aspects of wealth data, which can be representative of the benefits of home ownership. This includes median household income, whether a person owned their home or not, the self-reported value of the property, and the segregation race percentage of the area. At the time of this map's creation, the most recent data was from 2019 and 2020. For this map, I envisioned users and organizations who are local to Lexington and would take this knowledge and use it when making decisions regarding equitable access to funding in these redlined areas for local revitalization programs. So I know my user, I have a rough idea of the data I want to work with, and I have a mock-up wireframe of the end goal. I've included this slide to give context for how I made my interactive map, 
But for more transparency, I'll direct you toward the Slack channel documents, which has my GitHub, and it hosts the related Jupyter notebook that goes in the detail of the project. The resulting map has two side-by-side -side maps on a computer screen. Both maps, if clicked, move in sync and zoom at the same level as the user interacts with the map. A live demonstration would show this activity best. However, since one never knows how internet connections will work at a conference, I put together some slides to simulate. And for those of you with internet access, feel free to visit the link displayed to interact with the map yourself. On the web page, there are two side-by-side -side maps. And the left-hand map is your historical redlining mapping file. And this is the only data that is presented on this left-hand side. The bottom left is a legend that communicates the relationship between the Hulk assigned grade and the likelihood of getting a loan. Levels include unlikely, somewhat likely, more likely, and most likely. And on the top right is actually a button that gives more historical context to redlining. The right-hand side map accesses all the US Census Bureau data of interest by track level. And the bottom left again is a gradient legend, and the top right is a drop-down menu to select data of interest. And when you click the legend and the map data updates. So options within this menu to select include percent white population, the median income, the percent ownership, and the median reported property value all by census tract. And these maps used in unison communicate an overall relationship that as the increase in Census Bureau data occurs, be it an increased median income or percent ownership or property value, the census tract color gets darker in gradient and it typically occurs in the Hulk neighborhoods most likely to obtain a loan. And vice versa. Still to this day, the Hulk neighborhoods who were least likely to obtain a loan because of the quote, hazard rating that was influenced by racist practices remain on the lighter end of the gradient and are typically the lower Census Bureau data values. Let's look at Ashland Park for a neighborhood likely to have obtained a loan in 1930. I choose Ashland Park for a reason. While working on a draft chapter for a proposed book with the working title Racialized Landscapes Part 1, Dr. Rich Shine at University of Kentucky found a racially restrictive deed within Ashland Park. And the deed includes language such as, nor shall black people occupy property in Ashland Park except as servants in a white owned house. So let's take a look at some of these ratings. Within Ashland Park, the Hulk map would have had this red line grade as an A, but this corresponds to the likelihood of most likely to be able to get a loan. And based on today's Census Bureau track data, which is 2019, 2020, we have the percent white population of 93%. The annual median household income for this census track is $101,000. And the percent of homeowners is 61% while the median property value is $425,000. This is of 1,300 houses that are self-reported. While over on the north side of Lexington, where we have the white population percentage is lower, we see west of Newtown Pike, a red line grade of what would have been D, which is unlikely to have obtained a loan. Currently, within the 2019 census tract data, the percent white population is 24%. Your annual median household income is $30,000, not 100,000. The percent of homeowners is 46%, not 61. And the median property value is 49,600. That's almost 10 times less than what is seen in Ashland Park. So how is it possible the fingerprint of the Hulk map, which was only utilized as a financial loan program for three years, is still seen today? Hulk was not a pivot from the practices of the time. It fell in line with historically segregated blocks, racial restrictive zoning ordinances, and housing land use ordinances. The environment of racial loan practices historically paved the way for Hulk to step into the same queue, and the power of the Hulk map did not fade with time. Instead, continued roadblocks were created between black and minority populations from obtaining home ownership. From the 1920s to the 1950s, real estate agents swore to a code of ethics to not introduce races or nationalities that they deemed detrimental to property values based on their standards, i.e., they should maintain the current segregated neighborhood of whites only because any other race in their eyes was deemed detrimental. 
not long after Hulk, the Federal Housing Administration responsible for guaranteeing mortgage insurance made it near impossible for minorities to obtain a home loan from a bank based on their newly created guidelines, guidelines very similar to the Real Estate Code of Ethics. If a builder wanted to guarantee to be paid for their investment, they needed buyers who could get mortgage insurance, that is, white buyers. After World War II, the federal government supported suburbanization of metro areas, guaranteeing bank loans to mass production builders with FHA insurance, continuing to only support construction for whites-only projects or projects incorporating barriers between races, like this one built in Detroit, which still stands today. The VA now enters to help support returning veterans to secure a home loan. And FHA and VA together insured 50% of all new mortgages nationwide. And it became the FHA's policy that no guarantees would be made for mortgages to African Americans or to whites who might lease to African Americans, regardless of an applicant's credit worthiness. So by 1959, less than 2% of FHA insured housing built was available for minority or ethnic minorities. With limited housing available, whenever a real estate speculator offers a home to a minority family, even at higher costs, it's one of their few opportunities during this time to purchase a home. Real estate speculators did this to accomplish block busting. They move one minority family into a neighborhood and essentially try to scare the white neighbors to sell at a loss to the speculator and then turn around and sell the home at inflated costs to other minorities. For black populations, the same home costed significantly more than their white counterpart paid for it. The entire time, what housing black populations did have available was often obtained on private agreement contracts with real estate speculators, since no insurance, thanks to FHA guidelines, were being offered. Contracts required no down payment or closing costs from buyers, as they were already owned by the speculator. These contract payments were, however, much higher than what whites were paying for their insured home mortgage. And the contracts also built no equity in the home, could have the rent raised at any time, and upon missing one payment, the owner would be evicted with no equity returned. The speculator could even terminate the contract at any time. From 2000 up until 2008's financial collapse, reverse redlining was prevalent where banks and lending institutions target their marketing to the 1930s redline neighborhoods for subprime home mortgages without disclosing all details pertaining to the loans. These subprime mortgages had high closing costs, high prepayment penalties, and low initial interest rates that drastically increased after the contract was signed. And this was only 14 years ago, which brings us closer to, pre to present day and my map. So we have our problem outlined and traced along a road that was paved over a century ago, and a reinvented map demonstrating the continued lingering impact. I'm not disillusioned enough to think my map will repair or return the equitable opportunities related to wealth denied in these red line neighborhoods of Lexington. Instead, it is my hope that this map provides the context necessary for the Lexington audience to understand the situation as it developed and acknowledge it as it still stands. This whole topic is very complex, and there are a lot of layers to it. I don't have all the answers, and neither does my map. However, in order to move forward, I do know we have to understand the truth about where we are coming from, and we have to understand the current relationships between the past and the present. This will allow us to open our minds to potential policies in promoting a more equitable, integrated society going forward. And with that, I'm happy to address any questions that my presentation may have inspired or subjects I rushed over that you'd like more clarity on. Thank you. Do we have any? Uh, all right, here we go. Is this on? Uh, as Amy Hilliard has shown, the HOLC maps were made after they had uh, made all of their mortgage lending and then were not shown to any of the private market lenders afterwards. So I wonder if you could explain the chain of causality from those uh, attractive maps to the modern uh, uh, issues. 
the chain of causality is, is, is a long and winding one. Um, briefly, you have a map, as we all understand, as cartographers, that has power, and when you have a map that demonstrates a certain area, people are drawn towards making assumptions about them based on these areas. And from then, you have financial loan institutions who are trying to protect their interests and their investments, and you have a whole society that has these ingrained thought processes. It's, it's a lot more complicated and longer than probably the 40 seconds I have to explain, but I am happy to talk with you on another side. How who would do what if they never saw the maps? Since the lenders never saw those HOLC maps. Mm -hmm. So they never saw the maps, but they were given a grade whenever someone was looking for, you have the real estate agents or the people that were assigned to the Hulk program. They would go out and they're looking at a neighborhood and they get the applications and they say, this application for this particular home is in this particular neighborhood and those people are giving the assignment of, oh, well this map, based on our maps locally, this is a hazard rating of D based on the population living here. And then they put that on the application and they send that to the lenders. So the lenders may not see the maps, but they see the rating that was given based on the people on the ground. Do we have any other questions? All right, thank you, Rebecca.